This is the uh, continuation in the series of uh, demonstrations of uh, abdominal extension in newborns and preemie growers. And in part two, I talked about a normal gas pattern uh, in this age group, as well as what represents symmetric or nonspecific distension. And I did show you an example in the previous uh, section that there is one particular situation where you often will end up with a very abnormal and suspicious looking gas pattern that often turns out to be nothing and that was administering midriatics to babies when they're assessing the retina for uh, retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, and I did fail to give a more common example of that and that's the first slide I want to show you here. This is a baby that was born with hyalomembrane disease and these are two different chest x-rays approximately uh, one or two hours apart for catheter placement. You can see his NG tube ends blindly in the upper esophagus with air in the GI tract. So this was a classic esophageal atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Well, in a situation like that, since the lungs are relatively non-compliant or stiff, uh, when the respirator cycles, you can see it was intubated on the follow-up film, when the respirator cycles air will preferentially tend to go through the, uh, the tracheoesophageal fistula into the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So here's a supine and left lateral of the cubitus view on that same baby a couple hours after he was intubated. And you can see this is marked asymmetric distension. There are multiple elongated loops of small bowel, no air fluid levels, no pneumatosis, no air in the rectum. So we informed the neonatologist that this may strictly be a mechanical phenomenon because of air being forced through the distal tracheoesophageal fistula. But because there was no air in the rectum, we couldn't rule out that there was an associated distal intestinal obstruction. Well, this is the same baby about six hours later. And you can now see that he's finally got air in the rectum and he still has this very abnormal gas pattern which in an otherwise normal patient would make you worry about either necrotizing enterocolitis or possibly a functional distal intestinal obstruction. But this is the same baby about 12 hours later after they placed the G-tube and they put a ligature uh, at the level of the esophagogastric junction to protect the GI tract from forcibly uh, uh, pushing air uh, into, the, uh, into the stomach and distal gastrointestinal tract. The more common example of this kind of a situation, which gives you a really suspicious gas pattern, is any baby that, that uh, is being resuscitated via a mask. Uh, obviously, when, 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 uh, when, so when that situation occurs, air is often forced down the esophagus. So you can almost always identify a patient that was recently resuscitated because they'll have a very ugly gas pattern as well but usually it will resolve over time with nasogastric section. You know, any baby with, with, with uh, even nonspecific bowel distension, uh, they'll always back up on feeding these babies and put them on uh, NG suction for a day or two because just bowel distension in and of itself, uh, if you keep feeding the baby, can precipitate necrotized enterocolitis. So again, these are, these are two situations where air is forced down the esophagus, uh, you can end up with a very ugly gas pattern that, that really uh, should not evolve into uh, any, other, uh, any other problems. Okay, I, I talked about symmetric bowel distension or nonspecific, and now I'm going to spend some time talking about asymmetric bowel distension, and then the remainder of this discussion will be about necrotizing enterocolitis. Asymmetric bowel distension, if present, may be a sign you're dealing with either a distal intestinal obstruction or bowel ischemia, and again, most commonly, we're referring to necrotizing enterocolitis. So the findings in asymmetric bowel distension, there are either larger loops in one portion of the abdomen than another portion of the abdomen. Small bowel loops should never be seen lengthwise in so-called nonspecific distension. Fluid levels are not usually seen in patients that have nonspecific distension. Uh, the only fluid levels that you can see normally are in the stomach, obviously, and for some reason you can have a fluid level in the rectum and it usually means absolutely nothing. So these are the, these are the things we're looking for when we uh, read an abdominal radiograph. 
as asymmetric bowel distension. Uh, not all those babies will end up with uh, NEC, uh, but the, as I said, the neonatologists will often back up, back off on feeding the baby and put them on NG, NG suction for a day or two until the distension uh, is improved or resolved. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is, is air fluid levels, and I've alluded to this before. These are two different patients, both decubitus films, and just to remind you that fluid levels are slightly curved. And the smaller the baby, the more that curve pattern can be seen. So this is an air fluid level, this is an air fluid level, this is an air fluid level. A different patient with obviously a, a longer uh, uh, dilated loop of uh, bowel, and the fluid level will be more, more horizontal or vertical, if you will. Here there's a fluid level. There the fluid level is slightly curved because it's a much smaller loop. And again, the reason for that is the meniscus comes into play more when you have a very small loop with an air fluid level versus a very large loop with an air fluid level where you really won't even detect the meniscus. This patient obviously had uh, free air as well, localized perforation. Okay, so here, this is, a, this is just a supine view on, uh, the, uh, on a patient. Uh, with a follow-up less than 24 hours later. And there is some asymmetry in the bowel distension. There's an elongated loop. It may be the descending colon, but I've already said that one of the cardinal rules about reading neonatal radiographs, uh, as well as radiographs in preemie growers, is it's not always clear what represents colon versus small bowel, uh, except for the rectosigmoid. And just to remind you, be very aware that a diaper can look just like pneumatosis intestinalis. So whenever you see the diaper artifact outside the patient, be very careful when it's overlapping the remainder of the abdomen. So this is a patient that went from a mildly suspicious gas pattern to a gas pattern that was completely normal in less than 24 hours, and that's with the NG tube not even in an appropriate position to keep the GI tract decompressed. Obviously, if you want to keep air from getting into the stomach and distal gastrointestinal tract, has to be at least in the distal body or the antrum uh, since air collects in that area with the patient's supine. Now this is a patient that has more distended loops of bowel in the left side of the abdomen than on the right side. Uh, obviously on the cube you can see that something down here must have been sigmoid because all of a sudden you have a large amount of air in the rectum and also happens to have an air fluid level which doesn't mean anything. But there are some air fluid levels over here on the left lateral decubitus film. So this is what we would say mild asymmetric bowel distension and it at least deserves a follow-up. There's no pneumatosis here. Different, different patient, again, has bigger loops on the right side of the abdomen than on the left side. Uh, some of these loops are probably a little elongated and there are too, too many there to be all uh, colon. Obviously, some of this must be colon because, again, on the decube, you have air rising into the rectum, whereas there was no rectal air on the spine film and there are a few air fluid levels in the right upper quadrant. Well, this patient obviously has a right inguinal hernia, but he definitely has asymmetric bowel distension. There's much bigger loops in the right side of the abdomen and on the left side. No real air fluid levels. There's no pneumatosis. Uh, only the pediatrician knows whether the patient has a freely reducible inguinal hernia. Uh, if it's incarcerated, obviously this would, this would uh, make you suspect more that he has a a bowel obstruction as a result of the incarcerated hernia. Well, this, this is a clearly multiple elongated loops of small bowel. These are not in the distribution of the colon. There are too many elongated loops to be the colon. Um, yeah, not much in the way of air fluid levels, but anytime you see small bowel like this, uh, in the, and he's, a, he's an older premature baby, so uh, this would be highly suspicious of necrotizing or colitis. There is no pneumatosis here. Different patient, with, there are too many elongated loops of bowel here to all be colon, so there's a lot of elongated small bowel here, not much in the way of air fluid levels, and again, this, this kind of situation uh, deserves close uh, follow-up. Uh, although obviously you have to take into account the clinical history, which I'll discuss more in uh, a few minutes. Different patients, same thing. Multiple elongated loops. There are too many in this area to be, all be colon. Some of those have to be small bowel. Different patients, same thing. Uh, he has some air fluid levels on the right side, right upper quadrant. Multiple elongated loops. And another example, don't get 
caught in the trap of assuming this might be pneumatosis, because if you'll notice on the decubitus film, there's nothing in that area. This is just the overlying diaper uh, giving you a, a false impression of pneumatosis. You know, there's some asymmetry here. There's slightly bigger loops on the left side. You know, could that be the descending colon? It could be. You have this much larger loop here, which, again, more often than not, the decube will answer the question that it's actually air in the sigmoid colon because on the decube it has risen up into the uh, rectum, and also the rectum has an air fluid level. Uh, there's another abnormal air fluid level here in the right upper quadrant. So this is mild asymmetric bowel distension and probably deserves follow-up. Uh, this is a different patient, although it looks similar to an earlier one. He, again, he's got multiple elongated loops of bowel on the right side of the abdomen compared to the left. Not much in the way of air fluid levels. He's got air in the rectum. This baby was treated for necrotizing enterocolitis with no sequelae. Uh, never had free air and never had pneumatosis. This is just a 24-hour follow-up on that same baby just to show you that distension got worse. Never really had pneumatosis, uh, didn't have any fluid levels, and as I said, he recovered without sequelae. Different patient, also asymmetric distension, not unlike the ones I've shown you earlier. Okay, this is the this is this is a relatively unremarkable gas pattern. Um, I think uh, this baby was only a day or two old, and you know, there's no distension, there's no elongated small bowel loops. Uh, no pneumatosis, no fluid levels, but this is the patient four days later, and you can see he's developed pneumatosis, pneumatosis intestinalis. He's developed multiple elongated loops, some of which have to be small bowel. He's got at least this one large fluid level in the left mid-abdominal region, so he was a, obviously a proven necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, when you have a patient, so if you have a patient that has asymmetric bowel distension, you really need to take into consideration the various uh, the signs, symptoms, as well as the history. And two of the most important things are the gestational age and the chronologic age. Uh, as I'll show you in a, in a, in a, in a few a few seconds, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is much, much, much more common in the premature infant. Chronologic age is almost as important because if you have a baby that develops diffuse bowel distension and has that asymmetric gas pattern, you're going to be much more concerned that this may be a distal intestinal obstruction, although necrotizing enterocolitis can present as early as the first day of life. Uh, the stooling history is obviously important when you're worried about a distal intestinal obstruction. The uh, bilious vomiting, non-bilious vomiting, both of them can occur in NEC or uh, distal intestinal obstruction. These other, these these six other findings below. These are these are things that you look for, especially if you're worried about ne necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, the ischemic disorders that we deal with. Again, the two most important ones are necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, and less common but still fairly frequent is so-called spontaneous intestinal perforation. Uh, they don't really know the etiology of this, although some people uh, feel that it is related to treatment of patients with NSAIDs, uh, whether it's endocin or I think in this institution they use ibuprofen. These patients clinically do not act like a patient with necrotizing enterocolitis. They have, they have none of the other clinical features that you usually see, but they will all of a sudden just have a spontaneous pneumoperitoneum with a localized perforation, usually in the small bowel, usually the distal ileum. These other four, four entities are obviously ischemic disorders, uh, but uh, they rarely present with diffuse abdominal distension. If you Oh, at least mid-gut mid -gut volumes with infarction. It's extremely uncommon to present with diffuse bowel distension. If you do see diffuse bowel distension in the setting of, uh, of mid-gut volumes, chances are they've infarcted their entire mid-gut. These, these last three here present usually more with obstruction than ischemia, but since, since there is a component of vascular compromise, I just put it in this category of ischemic disorders, but all I'm going to discuss uh, in this section is uh, necrotizing enterocolitis and also spontaneous intestinal perforation. Okay, as I said, necrotizing enterocolitis, 90% of the cases will be in the premature infant, only 
uh, in term babies, and usually they have a risk factor, often congenital heart disease. Uh, you can see it uh, affects uh, approximately 10% of babies that are very low birth weight, which is defined as less than 1,500 grams. Uh, extremely low birth weight is defined as less than less than 1,000 grams, and they obviously have the worst uh, mortality compared to the uh, babies that are under 1,500. Perforation in 12 to 31 percent, and usually within 48 hours of the onset of the disease. And a third of patients, pr particularly premature infants with necrotic necrotizing enterocolitis will require some surgical intervention, whether it's placement of a drain or a formal laparotomy. And uh, more and more very low birth weight infants uh, uh, are often being treated initially uh, with just peritoneal drainage, although if they tru truly have necrotizing enterocolitis as the underlying cause, a significant percentage of those will, those will have, a, have to have a subsequent formal laparotomy. Okay, so the x-ray signs, uh, and I'm going to show you examples of all these. The, the key, the first finding is asymmetric bowel distension, and that's when you need to suggest the possibility that this may be, may, baby may evolve into a, a full-blown necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, again, the predominant finding of, of asymmetric bowel distension is seeing elongated loops of small bowel, especially if they have air fluid levels. Not all babies, at least early on, will have pneumatosis intestinalis. If you see pneumatosis intestinalis, uh, there are no benign causes for that as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, the only issue is, is confusing meconium mixed with air with pneumatosis. But true pneumatosis, proven pneumatosis, virtually is uh, pathognomonic of necrotizing enterocolitis. You can have bowel wall or bowel thinning, you often will have air fluid levels. I've often struck how almost all articles on NEC don't even discuss air fluid levels. I think they have some importance, uh, not that they have any great prognostic significance, but if you see a lot of air fluid levels in a baby with necrotizing enterocolitis, I think that that is one factor that, that, may, that may make you concerned that the prognosis may be a little bit more guarded as, well, as far as well, whether the baby may go on and perforate. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing uh, premature babies that just have a persistent paucity of bowel gas. And that may be the only finding uh, in a baby that goes on and develops formal NEC and perforates. Portal venous air, I'll show you examples. Probably the most significant finding as far as of prognostic significance is if you see a persistent or sentinel loop Often those babies go on and have to have a formal laparotomy because of failure of appropriate medical management or the baby's just uh, crashing and, and operative intervention is indicated even though there's no evidence of free air on, on radiographs. Pneumoperitoneum, obviously, and mass effect on bowel, uh, either by ultrasound or by plain film, may be an indication that there's a walled-off perforation Diagnosing a Waldorf perforation on plain films is more difficult, but if you can make that diagnosis, it has the same significance as a free perforation. That usually means a formal laparotomy or at least peritoneal drainage is indicated. Okay, uh, we, do, we do not do many ultrasounds in our patients. There are programs that rely very heavily on ultrasound in the initial diagnosis as well as follow-up. I know that I, I read an article uh, of an institution where they may do an initial supine and decubitus view of the abdomen, but then all of their follow-up follow examinations in patients that they suspect NEC are by ultrasound. And it is true that apparently you can, you can see all, virtually all of the X-ray findings uh, on ultrasound that you see on, on plain abdominal radiate rafts. Uh, one thing that, 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 that is pretty consistent from article to article is that uh, there are two things that, that are most worrisome uh, as far as uh, sonographic findings, and that's demonstration of dirty peritoneal fluid, peritoneal fluid with a lot of echoes in it, uh, usually means that the patient is perforated. Again, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, if you have a very small amount of free air, I'm not so sure I would ever want to rely on an ultrasound to make that diagnosis as opposed to a plain thumbs. And I showed you several cases uh, in part one 
of a very small pneumoperitoneum uh, where you could barely even see it on the supine film, but only saw it on the DQ. Uh, the other finding that, that they will report that's, that's uh, suspicious or, or maybe a, a sign of impending perforation, and that's when the bowel wall uh, gets thin and becomes relatively uh, hypovascular or avascular. Often those are babies that will go on and perforate. All right, this is a uh, uh, this is a premature baby that really had a normal abdomen about uh, uh, three days of age, and then out of a clear, no further problems, you know, as far as the abdomen. All of a sudden, this abdomen got distended at about three weeks of age, and this is his first radiograph since that initial normal abdomen. And obviously, it shows a pneumoperitoneum with a falciform ligament, the football sign. Uh, again, that's the falciform ligament. Because clinically, uh, uh, he was in such poor clinical condition, they did a formal laparotomy uh, and found uh, necrosis of the transverse colon from necrotized anticholitis. So every so often, the pneumoperitoneum is the first sign of NEC. This is not typical, but, but if every NEC presented this way, you wouldn't have much use for radiologists. This is also a baby that was about uh, three weeks of age, he actually had an upper GI series when he was about a week of age because of feeding intolerance. It was a normal study. And then he did fine for two weeks, and all of a sudden one day he just became horribly distended and had this supine radiograph. Uh, as usual, they only did a supine film, but about an hour later they did this to cube. That's why you see the NG tube on the cube and not the supine. He's got pneumatosis everywhere, massive portal venous air. Um, and so they, because of his clinical uh, state, they took him right to surgery. Uh, and he had, he had no perforation, and we don't see any evidence of free air on the cube. Uh, they found no perforation, but he had multiple segments of severely ischemic small bowel, all of which were resected. And uh, he had an enterostomy and, and several mucous fistulas. Uh, and believe it or not, this baby, I think, I think, I think he's six or seven or eight months old now, and he's still alive today. So despite how awful the radiograph looked and how dramatic his surgical findings were and all the, 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 the surgery he underwent, he actually is a survivor. Okay, now this is a more typical case. You know, this kid was, uh, he was actually a 500 grammer and day two or three of life. Asymmetric bowel distension. Again, there's many elongated loops. Some of those have to be small bowel. No air fluid levels. And this is the same patient six hours later, and you can see he developed pneumatosis in the right side of the abdomen. You know, it's the same on both views. Uh, maybe, maybe an air fluid level over here on the follow-up the cube, maybe here. And this is the typical uh, sequence of events with necrotized enterocolitis. Different baby. Uh, uh, th this is another example also of don't confuse diaper with pneumatosis. This baby just has asymmetric bowel distension, has some scattered air fluid levels in the upper right upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. Uh, but again, multiple elongated loops of small bowel, no portal venous air, no free air. But this is the same same patient uh, six hours later, and you can see the dramatic progression has more, more significant dilatation, pneumatosis uh, in both flanks, as well as in the rectum. Um, I, didn't, I don't need to go back to it, but there were no model lucencies in the rectum on the previous uh, abdominal radiograph, so there's no way this is stool. This is actually rectal pneumatosis with, all, with a lot of portal venous air as well. Different patient with, you know, some mild bowel asymmetry. There's larger loops on the right side of the abdomen, uh, few air fluid levels, you know. Actually, you know, eh, not really much in the way of air fluid levels, actually. Just, just the asymmetric distension with larger loops on the right side, gastric distension. And this is two days later, and you can see he's developed pneumatosis in multiple bowel loops on the right side of the abdomen. You know, now it's got an air fluid level over here. Different patient also, 
more dilated loops seen in this area than the rest of the abdomen, and some of those must be elongated small bowel loops, not much in the way of air fluid levels. This is the same patient three days later, and you can see he's got more asymmetric bowel distension, pneumatosis in the right and left side, portal venous air, and multiple air fluid levels on the DQ. All right, now this is a patient that has obviously marked asymmetric bowel distension, multiple elongated loops of small bowel, multiple air fluid levels on the decubitus film, and portal venous air. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about portal venous air in a few minutes, but usually when you have portal venous air, um, you have pneumatosis. There, there probably is some pneumatosis in this area right here, like curvilinear pneumatosis. Okay, now I'm just going to show you several examples, you know, relatively quick of pneumatosis and the variation in its appearance. Uh, this, is, this is cystic pneumatosis in this area as well as in this area. There's subtle portal venous air over here. And just to remind you, uh, this is properitoneal fat. You don't see it in that area so much on the supine film, but it's not uncommon to see it more dramatically on the DQ for the reasons I discussed previously. He happens to be turned to the left, which is going to show you a more uh, thickened part of the uh, normal properitoneal fat, so it should not be confused with free air. A bunch of elongated loops of small bowel, and again, predominantly cystic pneumatosis on the right side and less so on the left side. Different patients, same thing, just to show you pneumatosis. Uh, multiple air fluid levels as well, there, there, there. Okay, now, uh, pneuma pneumatosis uh, can be cystic, which is probably air in the submucosal layer of the small or large bowel, or it can be curvilinear. And the curvilinear pneumatosis is probably in the subserosal layer of the bowel, has the same significance, and this is what, this is what classic subserosal pneumatosis looks like. It's a curvilinear uh, lucency paralleling the, uh, the uh, outer wall of the bowel. You know, this is probably a little bit of cystic pneumatosis over here. And again, multiple air fluid levels, portal venous air. This is another example with, with predominantly subserosal or curvilinear pneumatosis. Uh, multiple areas, especially on the right side. You know, more dramatic, dramatic example of curvilinear subserosal uh, sub, uh, pneumatosis intestinalis. Same thing you know, in this loop of bowel down here. You know, a more dramatic example of the same thing. It's probably more mixed here. Uh, it's mixed cystic and, sub, you know, cystic and curvilinear. Also has a pneumoperitoneum. Lucencies over the liver here, which you can't see on the supine film. Another example where it's mixed, where you have curvilinear pneumatosis. Uh, here it's more cystic in this part of the abdomen, portal venous air multiple air fluid levels. Different patients, same thing. Uh, this is curvilinear or subserosal pneumatosis in cystic, and he's also got portal venous air. And I've shown you this case before. Uh, uh, it's also an example of mixed. This is curvilinear or subserosal pneumatosis, and here it's a combination of cystic and subserosal. And again, I think I showed you this case as an example of a walled-off pneumoperitoneum. There's no way a loop of bowel would ever uh, have this configuration. So this is uh, air uh, loculated between uh, two loops of bowel, you know, a predominantly cystic pneumatosis on the left side. Now there's, uh, well, this is, this is sort of a dramatic example of a linear or curvilinear pneumatosis in this loop of bowel. It's probably a loop of small bowel on the left side of the abdomen, and it's got cystic pneumatosis on the right side. Now, there's a, there's a subgroup of patients with nectarized enterocolitis that, for some reason, it's, it's almost often seen in term babies with NEC, and that's where they present with so-called pneumatosis coli. They have pneumatosis that's pretty much confined to the colon, and they often have very little, if any, small bowel distension to go along with it. In most cases I've shown you of, of, of proven nectarized enterocolitis, there's some degree of small bowel distension. But for some reason, in this subgroup of term babies with NEC with so-called pneumatosis coli, 
you don't see much in the way of small bowel distension. You just tend to have a lot of uh, pneumatosis throughout the colon. This is going all the way down to the rectum, by the way. Um, these babies tend to have a much, much more benign clinical course than a premature baby with your typical pneumatosis. Again, no one really knows why. This is another patient probably with the same thing. This is predominantly uh, pneumatosis throughout, you know, you see it better on the cube, I think. Pneumatosis pretty much confined to the colon with very little, if any, small bowel distension. Another patient with the same thing. I think I showed you this in an earlier talk as an example of in a term baby how you can sometimes see hostra in the colon. But here the pneumatosis is sort of confined to the descending and sigmoid colon. And again, uh, none of these babies went on and perforated. They generally run a uh, much more benign course. Okay, uh, one thing that I just I would just advise you, uh, especially uh, since we often have sort of grainy, poor quality images, uh, when you're trying to evaluate an abdomen that, that looks ugly like this and you want to really check for portal venous air, you really need to window and level the settings uh, and that's what, this is the same radiograph, uh, and I think you can see there's very subtle portal venous air. If you make the image darker and less, less contrasty, uh, it's much harder to see on the actual image that came through, uh, uh, put through by the technologist. So always when to level, and you may pick up very subtle portal venous air. It just allows you to make the diagnosis more precisely uh, at that point in time as opposed to waiting for the baby to develop uh, more classic uh, signs of NEC. Another patient, same thing. He obviously has pneumatosis intestinalis, but you know it's sort of subtle whether or not he's got portal venous air, but if you window and level it, uh, it's more obvious that there is indeed Air in the portal system. Okay, and I, as as, if you, as you've seen all along, almost the majority of cases of patients with portal venous air often have pneumatosis with it. But I have several here that have portal venous air but no pneumatosis. This is a patient. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's sort of the rounded density right here. This is a baby that actually had perforated NEC several weeks earlier, and had a diverting. Uh, ileostomy, and that's what this is right here. So that tells you that all of these loops are obviously small bowel uh, uh, because he sh shouldn't have air in his colon. So he has marked uh, air throughout the uh, throughout the portal venous system of the liver, but no pneumatosis that I can see anyway. Another patient with the same thing. I mean, you know, it's you know it's questionable whether there's some pneumatosis here, but there's definitely a lot of portal venous air. Uh, marked asymmetric bowel distension, multiple air fluid levels. And here's a patient whose bowel distension is really minimal. I think you can say for sure there are some elongated small bowel loops, although none of them appear particularly dilated, but there's air in the portal venous system. And air in the portal venous system, unless you have an umbilical vein catheter in place, is virtually pathognomonic of necrotized enterocolitis. Okay, bowel wall thickening, uh, you know, uh, it can be subtle, uh, you know, and it, you really need to have the supine and the cube to say it for sure, but like in this area, and this, this is the, again, I showed you this case uh, just a few minutes earlier, it's another example of, of significant bowel wall thickening. If, if you look at these adjacent loops and look at that thickness and divide by two, that's that bowel wall is much too thick, especially for bowel that's somewhat distended. So this is an example of bowel wall thickening. It's just something that supports the diagnosis of, uh, of necrotizing enterocolitis. Different patient, again, when you have loops adjacent to each other that are that dilated, the bowel wall, the summation of the two uh, uh, bowel wall loops should not be that wide. So you can make the diagnosis of bowel wall thickening. Obviously, uh, ultrasound is probably more reliable. Uh, as I said, we just don't tend to use that technology here for our patients. You know, when you first look at this patient, he's obviously got portal venous air. You think this is regular sign. You're actually seeing the double wall sign, but it really isn't. This is just a dis distended loop of bowel with another loop adjacent to it. 
uh, it gives you false appearance. If, if he had a pneuma peritoneum, I would expect this was a this was a relatively virgin abdomen with abdominal distension. So I would expect free air to extend to some extent over the liver. So this is just a markedly thickened bowel wall being demonstrated by the uh, the adjacent uh, loop, and that loop does have a long fluid level in it. There's another fluid level here. This is another patient with asymmetric bowel distension, and again, this this area between these two loops of bowel is much too wide, so he definitely has thickening of bowel wall. Okay, I've only seen this once. Uh, obviously, this is an old <clears throat> an old case. It's probably from the probably from the 80s, and this is a baby that had abdominal distension, you know, and it's a little bit asymmetrical. And this is that same baby the next day. And all the bowel wall, or almost all the bowel wall, has completely disappeared. So I don't know what else to call this except the disappearing bowel wall sign. And uh, within a matter of hours, uh, this baby uh, expired. Because when the bowel wall gets that thin, they probably get uh, perforations in multiple places. I said, I've only seen it once, uh, but if you ever see it, it's, it's a, a very ominous uh sign. Okay, and I, as I said earlier, uh, probably the most uh, reliable sign of a baby that has perforated or will go on and perforate is if you see a sentinel or fixed loop. And so I'm going to show you several examples of that. Um, this is a supine and left, left lateral cubitus in a baby with obvious cystic pneumatosis and asymmetric bowel distension. Most of these elongated loops are going to be small bowel. Uh, you know, air fluid level here, there, maybe there. And this is the same patient within 24 hours. Uh, these are two supine views that are several hours apart, but both within 24 hours of that prior radiograph I showed you. And you can see how these loops are starting to look really fixed. I mean, technically, uh, images of abdomen you know, even several minutes apart or certainly a half hour, an hour apart, the bowel loops shouldn't have the same configuration assuming there's any peristalsis whatsoever. So when you see a sentinel loop or fixed loop hours apart or days apart, that's just a sign of relatively severe ongoing ischemia, ischemia and the bowel is just not peristalsing. <clears throat> and a lot of these babies will actually go on and have perforation by radiograph or they will go on and uh, uh, require exploratory laparotomy because their clinical findings deteriorate so rapidly that they, the surgeons know that they need to, uh, to operate. Okay, this is another patient that has a multiple elongated loops of small bowel, a lot of pneumatosis int intestinalis, a couple air fluid levels probably in the left flank, air fluid level here, air fluid level here. All right, the next radiograph, <clears throat> excuse me, Our follow-up decubitus films done five hours and ten hours after that radiograph I just showed you, and you can see these bowel loops are starting to look very, very uh, consistent. So this is another example of fixed loops of bowel, multiple air fluid levels. This is properitoneal fat. Don't confuse that with free air. This is subserosal pneumatosis. And uh, the next the next image is that same baby, also decubitus follow-up, 24, 48 hours. And you can see, although the total number of loops have diminished, he still has this one loop that's, that is fixed. And he went on and had surgery and had, uh, had a uh, perforation in his distal ileum, but never had free air. And, and I think I showed you uh, this in a previous uh in a previous talk is an example of how properitoneal fat, when you're rotated significantly to the left, will look much thicker and maybe, if you'll notice on this decube where he's rotated to the right, the properitoneal fat is much thinner. So this should still not be confused with free air. Okay, this is another example of a patient with a uh, fixed loop. Uh, he's got some mild subserosal pneumatosis, multiple air fluid levels, portal venous air, this is that same patient four hours and eight hours later, both supine views, and you can see how these bowel loops are pretty much completely unchanged. 
and that's never normal. And again, it, it's often a sign of uh, impending perforation, probably the most reliable of all the findings. Yeah, you could talk about the, the, the prognostic factors on, on plain radiographs. You know, pneumatosis in and of itself, portal venous air in and of itself, uh, even air fluid levels in and of themselves. But certainly degree, if you show me a patient that's got severe pneumatosis, especially if it doesn't get better, well, that's an ominous sign. If you show me a patient with portal venous air on multiple radiographs over time, that's a very poor prognostic sign. Um, so I, I actually, I, don't, I couldn't find it. Uh, it's one of my old slides. But I actually had a patient uh, many years ago that had such severe portal venous air that on the LLD that accompanied the spine film, he actually had air in the right atrium. And, and, and he was, the, that patient expired within hours. So, again, it's a matter of degree, but, but fixed loops are probably the most reliable sign of a, uh, or the, the most reliable finding of a, of a possibly poor outcome. These are just the decubitus radiographs that go along with the previous supine that I showed you. Again, showing that these loops are very fixed, multiple air fluid levels. Uh, this is probably the worst one I've ever seen. Uh, this is the baby. This is, this is over several days. Uh, has pneumatosis intestinalis, obviously some distended elongated loops in the right side of the abdomen. Again, this is over several days. You notice how the, those loops never change. These are both supine films. And this is uh, probably two or three days out. Again, that loop is exactly the same. And on the final film, before they operated, you can see he's actually perforated. This is spouse form ligament. is thickened. Uh, this is air sort of under the central tendon, the so-called cupola sign. All right, now this is, a, I believe he was two or three days old, premature baby, has asymmetric bowel distension. There are too, ma too many elongated loops, especially on the right side of the abdomen. Not so much air fluid levels. Doesn't have air in the rectum. But clinically, he was acting like an NEC. And this is that patient the next day. You can see the air beneath the diaphragm, beneath the central tendon, obviously on the decubitus film. This patient got treated by placement of a peritoneal drain only and didn't require any subsequent surgery. So although clinically they thought he had necrotizing enterocolitis, this may actually be a case of so-called spontaneous intestinal perforation since a formal laparotomy was not required uh, down the road. This is a 1,100-gram baby, 22-weeker. Uh, this is a normal abdomen, first day of life for umbilical artery catheter placement, normal gas pattern, mild gastric distension. And don't get confused by these little bubbles that occur in these uh, warming mattresses. But this is that same patient five days later. Uh, all of a sudden, his abdomen is distended. He has a massive pneumoperitoneum. You can see regular signs virtually everywhere. No real pneumatosis, uh, maybe air fluid level here and here. They treated this baby with a drain. Uh, but if you'll notice, he still had, this is 24 and 48 hours, uh, very unusual once you place the drain to still have that much free air. This is 72 hours. I'm not sure why they insisted on supine the cube and a cross table lateral. But he obviously had a, a massive amount of free air that shouldn't be there to that degree once you drain them. So they did a formal laparotomy after this, uh, these, these images. And they found a localized perforation in the jejunum that they simply uh, oversewed. Um, if, this was a, if this was gross evidence of NEC at surgery, they never would have performed that kind of operation. So the fact that they simply oversewed the localized perforation uh, suggests to me that maybe this was a case of SIP as well. And I think I looked up uh, the history, and there was no record of this patient receiving uh, any, any form of NSAID. All right, this, is a, this, is a ba this, this baby was, I think, two days old, uh, and they, he had this asymmetric bowel distension, 
They treated him as if he was an NEC for two weeks. Uh, and this is him at like uh, uh, two weeks later. And he still has a very abnormal looking asymmetric bowel gas pattern. This is supine. This is LLD. And um, they were concerned that maybe they were missing the possibility of a distal intestinal obstruction all this time, even though clinically they thought it was NEC. So they asked us for an enema. And we did an enema, and it is sort of a microcolon, which I'll talk about more in the last part of this talk, reflex into a normal caliber terminal ileum. You can see the air-filled loops above that are markedly dilated. And clinically, they went in and operated, and he had, he had evidence surgically of NEC with a Waldorf perforation in the jejunum. Uh, so it may have been that those earlier radiographs were actually evidence of an obstruction due to the localized perforation that the baby was ultimately found to have. All right, now this is, the, I think, a four-day-old that was doing fine that, until all of a sudden he developed diffuse abdominal distension, acidosis, uh, hypotension, bluish discoloration of the abdomen, uh, and, a, and a precipitous drop in the platelet count. And uh, a drop in the platelet count is one of the most pertinent uh, laboratory findings that the neonatologist deals with. Uh, it usually is a sign of perforation or impending perforation. So they, 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 they put a drain in this patient's belly. They got out uh, pus and feculent material. This is actually, uh, it doesn't show well. I should have made this darker. This is actually free air over the liver on the, on the supine film. Uh, the main finding on the supine, on, I mean on the decubitus film. The main finding on the supine film is the asymmetric bowel distension. And let me just point out to you real quickly, uh, babies that have hyaline membrane disease or pneumonia, uh, just be aware. You can see air bronchorans in the lower lobe through the liver, but if you, if you pay careful attention, you'll notice that those linear lucencies are running a completely different course than portal uh, vessels would run. So it should, it should never be confused. It should never be con confused with portal venous air. Same thing here. These are air broker ramps. All right, that same baby, uh, like a, 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 week, a week after they uh, put the drain in, uh, for some reason, uh, they got hung up on the fact that his initial radiographs didn't have any rectal air. So they decided that they wanted to have an enema. So this is a water-soluble enema. And if you'll notice, uh, there's a perforation somewhere in the proximal descending colon with all of this contrast, probably extra peritoneal. This is just an earlier uh, image from the enema. This is a later image. You know, this is, again, this is probably extra peritoneal extravasation. Well, they went in and operated, uh, and they did find, you know, remember that he had had the drain earlier. They found uh, a 5 to 7 centimeter segment of dilated obstructed distal ileum. The, they said the colon looked okay, but just be aware, uh, all that means is the perforation, as you would suspect on the, as the, by the pattern of extravasation, this is a perforation of the posterior colonic wall, so they're not going to see that in the operating room anyway, uh, nor is it significant. If you have a perforation of the posterior wall where it stays retroperitoneal, it's not going to lead to any kind of problem as opposed to a perforation of the anterior wall where you're going to end up with peritonitis and meconium in the peritoneal cavity. So it's just, it's just an example of, you know, be real careful about... Uh, uh, acceding to the request to do an enema in these premature babies because you may be surprised what you end up with. Uh, this is a, this is a, a three-day-old, 31-week-old baby um, that was had abdominal distension. I think clinically they weren't convinced he had NEC. They thought more that maybe this was a distal obstruction. There was no air in the rectum. So they asked for an enema. And this animal is actually read as meconium plug syndrome, but to me it's really basically a normal enema in a, in a neonate. This is reflux into the appendix. They didn't reflux into the terminal ileum, but it's really not necessary. So it's really a normal enema, but here's the baby the next day. Uh, he probably had NEC, and uh, he obviously didn't perforate at the time of the 
enema, but the next day he perforated, and you can see there is some uh, extravasated contrast in the peritoneal cavity. Uh, you know, the, he's got the he's got the football sign with a falciform ligament. You know, my boss, Dr. Poole, taught me years ago: be careful doing enemas in premature babies because uh, they they are at, they are at the highest risk of of being perforated by the procedure itself, uh, as well as misdiagnosing a problem that really isn't there. Premi premature babies just follow their own rules. All right, this is, a, I believe, is a one-day-old, 37 weeks, so he's really term. Uh, his first radiograph, he's got abdominal distension, pneumatosis in the right flank. They, uh, they did surgery and found a localized perforation of the distal ilium. Uh, and the rest of the GI tract looked okay. They followed the colon up to the transverse colon. Uh, and so prior to reanastomosing the ilium to the colon, they always asked for an enema to prove uh, that uh, colonic strictures didn't go on and develop. Well, any stricture, but, but uh, since they can't fully examine the colon uh, surgically without having a very wide incision, uh, they will always ask for a, a preoperative enema just to make sure that they don't go on and develop colonic strictures after the initial perforation. And by the way, the most common site for a post-NEC stricture is the colon, usually in the descending or sigmoid colon. And you can see this patient had really a complete atresia uh, in the upper sigmoid colon or the junction of the descending and sigmoid colon. Okay, this is a baby that was treated successfully for NEC, but then developed a, a abdominal distension, so they asked for an enema. And you can see he has two tight strictures in his descending colon, all right? Uh, it's less common to demonstrate strictures uh, in babies that survive medical treatment for NEC. It's much more common in babies that have had evidence of a perforation or uh, had surgery because of suspected perforation. It's not uncommon for them to go on and develop colonic strictures. It's relatively less common in a patient that responds to medical therapy. Small bowel strictures uh, can be seen in babies that, that survive medical treatment of NEC. And the last case is just a, is another patient that was scheduled for uh, uh, reestablishment uh, uh, re of bowel continuity. So again, you always have to do a, a, an enema. And you can see he's got a, a relatively long stricture in the proximal descending colon. And this area never completely filled out, so this is also an area. Now, I'm not sure that that, that means that they have to go in and resect it, but this is also an area, uh, a relatively long area of stricture in the transverse colon. Um, so uh, the things you, you should take from this are uh, to understand what I mean when I say asymmetric bowel distension and what that may uh, portend. Uh, the most common thing you need to worry about, especially if it's a premature baby, especially after, first, after the first couple of days of life, that, that's necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, and uh, you know, I encourage you to just review these radiographs several times just so it crystallizes in your mind the variation, the varying ways it may present. And in the last uh, two parts of this talk, I'm going to talk about diffuse bowel distension due to either a functional or a uh, anatomic distal intestinal obstruction. Thank you.